Uh, we're in for a real treat today. Um, as an indiv individual practitioner, um, we often, uh, I often tend to see a securities panel like this and, and uh, along with my colleagues get a pretty good shudder up the back. Um, but as chair of advocates, as a member of advocates, and as a representative of uh, such, a, such a great organization that we have, uh, it's been a great treat um, to follow some of the predecessors that I've had and be able to work alongside the Securities Commissions, the groups that we have up here, uh, as well as the people that you see at this panel to help protect the public that we serve as financial advisors. Um, I'm gonna first introduce our panel that we have up here. Karen McGinnis is Vice President of Compliance with the Mutual Fund Dealers Association of Canada. Karen is responsible for the compliance, financial compliance, and mem membership services departments. Previously, she was employed as a forensic accountant with the Ontario Securities Commission, where she was involved with compliance and enforcement matters relating to mutual fund dealer registrants. Paul Riccardi is the Senior Vice President, Enforcement, Member Policy, and Registration at the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. Paul is responsible for the development and enforcement of IROC's member and market regulation policies, which governs Canada's equity and fixed income markets, as well as more than 200 Canadian investment dealers and their registered employees. Paul began his career as a lawyer in Winnipeg, where he practiced corporate and commercial law. Bill Rice has been chair and chief executive officer of the Alberta Securities Commission since 2005. At the time of his appointment, he had over 25 years of experience as a securities lawyer. Bill was appointed chair of the Canadian Securities Administrators, the umbrella organization of Canada's provincial and territorial, territorial securities regulators in 2011. Ed Waitzer is a professor and the Jaroslawski Dima Mooney Chair in the Corporate Governance and Director of the Hennick Center of Business for, and Law uh, at Cosgrove Hall and the Schulich School of Business at York University. Ed served as chair of the Ontario Securities Commission and was also the vice president of the Toronto Stock Exchange. He, he has written and spoken extensively on a variety of legal and public policy issues. Ed was chair of Strikeman Elliott LLP from 1999 to 2006 and remains a senior partner to those who practice uh, focuses on complex issues. A more detailed bio of our speakers can be found in the back of your agendas. So much is happening right now with the securities sector, and our panel will be touching on a number of key issues. We will hear from regulatory accountability, on um, exempt markets, crowdfunding, the client relationship model, along with other topics. So I'm really excited to turn things over to our panel to hear what they have to say. In terms of the order that we all have, we will commence with Ed, followed by uh, Bill, then Paul, and closing out the presentations will be Karen. Following the presentations, we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. So let me turn things over to Ed, and we'll start things off. Thank you. And, and for your leadership of advocates over the last year. Um, so I thought, I'd start by putting myself in the position of the three other people on this panel and sort of thinking about what would keep me awake at night. And I should preface this by saying um, the three of them live in a world that is far more challenging and complex and dynamic than the world I lived in when I served as a regulator, either at the Stock Exchange or at the Securities Commission. So, um, and I'm not personalizing to the three of them. Uh, people who work at the regulatory bodies and self-regulatory bodies today, in my experience, have as much or more sense of commitment and purpose and dedication to the task that, than we did back in the, quote, good old days. Uh, which were much simpler days. So th this is not taken to be critical, it's more taken to be uh, some very real challenges that I think we all face, but uh, the rubber hits the road when you get to regulation. 
and 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 the starting point is is the challenge of rebuilding credibility in markets and regulation. So just to give you a couple of numbers that some of you may be familiar with, and the, these are, uh, I think, July uh, data, survey data. Uh, the first one is, is University of Chicago Booth School of Finance. 79% uh, of investors have lack trust in our financial system. Uh, the next two are from the Center for Audit Quality, which is uh, an organization uh, funded by the accounting profession in the United States. Uh, again, July data, 61% of investors lack confidence in government regulators, and about 50% of investors lack confidence in boards of public companies. Um, so I guess boards look good by comparison, but when you have an environment where half your investor base uh, doesn't trust what you're doing, uh, we've got a problem. And, and, and that problem, that lack of confidence, lack of trust, wouldn't be so critical if financial markets were somehow self-contained. Uh, but as the financial crisis demonstrated, as I'm sure you're going to hear in your pensions panel or you'd hear in any discussion when we start to address issues of intergenerational equity, which is virtually every significant public policy issue on our agenda today. Um, the real economy needs the financial system to function and needs regulators to ensure that it does. So we can't kind of put this little problem in a box and sort of say it doesn't matter because it does. Rebuilding confidence means rebuilding credibility, restoring trust. Uh, new rules, while necessary, aren't sufficient. And I'm going to suggest to you that there are at least two other critical and systemic challenges which are, you know, I, can, I can identify the challenges. I, I'm not smart enough to come up with the answers. Uh, and, and that's what I think my three co-panelists struggle with uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. The first is we need to overcome the highly fragmented nature of our regulatory framework, both domestically and globally. And this isn't a pitch. I, I was introduced as a champion for national securities regulation. This isn't about national securities regulation. Quite frankly, I think that issue is of secondary importance. Um, what does matter are we need to figure out clear lines of authority. Uh, we need to figure out how to um, engender more leadership in policy making, uh, quicker response capability. And, and you know, our, our regulatory system is now set up so we have to do cost benefit analysis for new rules, which makes a lot of sense. The flip side of that equation is there are costs and benefits to inaction as well, and we tend not to measure those. And, and then the last thing we need to do is figure out more effective accountability mechanisms. That is, we operate in a system where regulators, while purporting to impose accountability on market actors, uh, really don't face any significant accountability other than the day-to-day -day vagaries of the media. Um, securities regulation has no political currency. Uh, trying to get things done is challenging, but conversely, not getting things done doesn't attract or, or putting regulatory initiatives into spin cycle where they just kind of get talked about uh, and, and in and of themselves become an intergenerational project doesn't attract any accountability. There's no accountability for performance. Um, the second is I think we need to rebuild capacity and in some cases uh, redraw competencies amongst the regulators. So the challenges that we face today and the regulatory instruments that may be appropriate uh, and the kinds of competencies that the regulator needs in order to deal with them may be different than the traditional paradigm. Let, let me give you two, uh, and in some ways, opposite illustrations. Uh, the first would be the client relationship model, uh, and, and I'll speak for a minute or two about the most current manifestation of that, which came out, I guess, last week, a discussion paper about uh, 
a fid imposing a fiduciary standard on, on investment professionals. Like many CSA projects, this truly has become an intergenerational project. It's, it's been out there for 20 years and kind of we take kind of we push on little pieces of it from time to time. Um, it's easily gained, it's easily deflected by, by various interest groups, including those in this audience. So we, we, we then come out this week with a discussion paper on a fiduciary standard for investment professionals. Um, and again, to put it in context, and, and it's a terrific paper. Uh, it is a very long and very academic paper. Uh, if those of you who read it, uh, there's something like 50 questions at the end of this thing. Um, and and it's, it's a little bit like regulators becoming like the system that they're trying to improve. So instead of striving for simplicity, they've come up with uh, something that's somewhat obtuse, not very user friendly. There's no summary at the beginning saying, here's the concept, which is a pretty simple concept. Um, it's not very accessible to comment and respond to. And what it essentially, and, and there's no articulation of, of underlying principles. Um, it essentially reviews what's been done in other jurisdictions over the last decade, Australia, United States, United Kingdom. Uh, two of the three of those have already taken action. The United States is caught up in its own political dynamic. Um, and then at the end frames a single question, even though in the other jurisdictions there's been a recognition that it may not be the right question, so, um, or it may only be part of the question. So the question that's framed is, should we have a fiduciary standard? Um, while in Australia and the UK, uh, they've already adopted rules uh, prohibiting uh, commissions in certain cases. So saying, look, at there are certain circumstances in which a fiduciary standard won't work, structural reform makes more sense. Or in many jurisdictions, they've moved to, um, and, and again, you may talk about this if, in the pension panel, to move to simplified default products as an alternative to a fiduciary standard. Um, that is, structural reforms aimed at dealing with, a, with conflicts in the supply chain rather than trying to impose a fiduciary standard. Well, what that, those alternatives are alluded to in the paper, but they aren't framed as alternatives in this discussion paper. Uh, there's a framing of costs, but not of benefits. Um, and at the end of the discussion paper, there's no recommendation. Uh, it's essentially saying, we're putting this out to see what people think, uh, and then we'll decide what to do next, which I would, categorize in my lack of leadership. So again, it's another chapter in a 20-year saga of the client relationship model uh, that invites a spin cycle response. The flip side would be the recent action of the CSA on uh, uh, the exempt market dealer framework. So here you have a situation where uh, the CSA, after an extensive notice and comment process that dealt, that dealt explicitly in the, in the comment process with the kinds of issues that are now being addressed, has decided to revise the rules in midstream without a notice and comment process uh, and creating a situation where there are winners and losers. The winners are those that are in the system and the losers are those who didn't get in the system and have now been denied access to the system. Um, and it's framed in terms of investor protection, but if you looked at the comment letter, and here we're talking about sophisticated, uh, uh, sophisticated market by and large, if you look at the comment letters, the comment letters coming back are largely in terms of reciprocity uh, with U.S. regulation and, and re reciprocal access to U.S. markets. Uh, again, an issue that was canvassed when the rules were initially adopted. So I put those out. On the one hand, action taken without um, regard for fairness or the prior rulemaking process. On the other hand, action not taken 
in an environment where the rest of the world has moved on. Again, not to be critical, but to illustrate the kinds of challenges that I think our regulators face in a world where there is a lack of clear lines of authority, uh, where there's a lack of accountability for performance, and, and both of those things tend to lead to a lack of leadership and policy making. I'm not sure who's next up. Well, that's quite an introduction to the uh, <laughs> representative of the securities uh, <clears throat> regulators. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me to, uh, here today. I congratulate you on a, an attendance uh, to come and listen to a subject entitled Regulatory Affairs. I would have expected to see a couple of tables of uh, people finishing off breakfast. Um, it's always um, interesting coming to Toronto, but I have to say this is the first time I would have arrived, turned on the television set, and been informed I should be uh, conserving water and uh, carrying a mechanical can opener at all times. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the exempt market and, and try not to get torqued off uh, too much by what Ed uh, had to say, but maybe I'll have a chance to come back to it. Um, the exempt market demonstrates for regulators the challenge we have in, in finding an, an appropriate balance. So we're trying to leave an area of the market open for uh, players to participate without an abundance of overwhelming rules and related costs, but at the same time uh, wanting to undertake our responsibilities to protect investors. At the moment, there's a significant amount of pressure on securities regulators to open up the territory of exemptions. It's interesting, we started looking at exemptions back in 2008-2009 as a result of the financial crisis. And at that time, uh, there was concern about the exempt market because we just witnessed some very significant problems in the exempt market. And the evidence would suggest that even the most sophisticated institutions in the world had been unable to protect themselves in the absence of regulatory authority and oversight. That obviously brought into, the, into question the ability of less sophisticated players to protect themselves in the area of the exempt market without commensurate uh, and related oversight and uh, regulatory uh, compliance obligations being present. Now uh, that we are in a recession and jobs have become a significant concern and the growth of small business is important at the political level, and the subject of capital raising for junior companies is a priority. There again is focus on the exempt market, but from the opposite uh, perspective. How do we assist in capital raising? How do you open up the market? How do you make, uh, offer greater opportunities for small companies to raise capital and uh, build businesses? So again, depending on where the pendulum is, the appropriate balance line continues to move. And depending on where you are in that pendulum, you can be right or wrong or off uh, to pretty significant degrees. So at the moment, we're looking at the accredited investor uh, exemption, the uh, minimum $150,000 uh, uh, investment exemption and the offering memorandum uh, exemption that's been available in provinces other than Ontario. The accredited investor exemption has been subject to significant criticism over the years because it's difficult to relate uh, a balance sheet or an income level to intelligent investing. And, and of course, uh, it's hard to find an objective test that says this person needs a level of protection and someone else does not need a level of protection. And to find the right bright line for the definition is, is absolutely impossible. But there has been a focus on financial stability 
and the financial wherewithal to withstand the risk and hopefully withstand the loss uh, has, been, has been taken as, as at least an appropriate test or maybe the best among uh, some not very appealing, appealing alternatives. The $150,000 exemption is not used very much and of course has less logic to it uh, to suggest that the more you invest, the more intelligent you're going to be in that investment certainly doesn't uh, hold true for, for very many people. But the logic was that if you could afford a certain level, then perhaps you could afford the risk. If you could afford the risk, then you didn't need as much, <laughs> as much protection. The offering memorandum exemption is the disclosure exemption, so can we feel that investors in the exempt territory can be properly informed, properly protected if they have a disclosure document that doesn't quite meet prospectus standards, but is less expensive for the issuer to put together and uh, to use in the undertaking of an offering. That exemption has been available across the country other than in the province of Ontario with a variation in the rules that apply I think that the review of the accredited investor exemption um, may see some changes, but so far nobody has been able to suggest a better alternative or a practical alternative. And I don't know that uh, we're going to define an appropriate alternative uh, to replace the, the financial uh, stability test. There was some suggestion that clearly over 10 years, the levels should be raised to match uh, the passage of time and the impacts of inflation. And uh, interestingly, in Calgary, when we put that proposal in front of a, a large group, the answer came back, well, you had it wrong back in 2002. They were much too high. So now they're finally at the appropriate level. You should leave it alone. So depending on your perspective, of course, uh, difficult to, uh, to get the, uh, the right spot. I don't know where the minimum exemption uh, provision will go. There's a suggestion it's not used very much. It doesn't appear to have a lot of logic to it. But again, many would come back and say, well, it's not really doing any harm. Kind of fills a hole. Um, don't get rid of it. The offering memorandum, interestingly, um, is undergoing a significant analysis in the province of Ontario. Uh, I don't know where they're going uh, with that at the Ontario Securities Commission. They wouldn't necessarily come up with an alternative offering memorandum, an offering memorandum at all. I think they're looking at things like term sheets as maybe alternatives. I think they have their minds open to a wide range of disclosure document exemptions. In the rest of the country, we're trying to determine whether we can take the offering memorandum exemption a little bit further and uh, consider the criticism we've received that for small issuances, the offering memorandum is still too expensive. And the expensive portion of the offering memorandum is the preparation uh, and auditing of financial statements. So we're looking at whether some graduated requirement in respect of financial statements for small issuances, and those would be in the territory of up to something like $500,000, whether in that territory there might be some relaxed requirements in the, in the territory of, of financial statements. When the exemptions were opened up to some degree back in 2002, we certainly in Alberta, and I believe the same thing would apply in other jurisdictions, saw an explosion really in the exempt market. So between 2002 and 2011, the exempt market in respect of amount of capital raised has increased 25 fold in the province of Alberta. So it's a very significant area of the capital markets and is attracting more and more attention of regulators across the country and uh, certainly in our jurisdiction. If there is to be a relaxation on the exemption side, and if there's to be a broadening of the range of potential retail investors, 
then regulators must see a filling of the investor protection gap somehow. And many of us hold the view that the answer would lie best with reliance on intermediaries, good advice, advisors. Can we open up the market in this territory and can we relax the rules and feel confident that we are undertaking our investor protection mandate by seeing a greater and greater role in quality intermediary uh, participation and advice. The Western provinces brought in the exempt market dealer registration uh, category in 2009, and I say the Western provinces because there was already uh, a requirement in Ontario East uh, for registration, although the category wasn't called exempt market dealer or EMDs. We published in 2007, implemented a rule in 2009, and then again in the Western provinces, we introduced what was called the Northwest exemption, trying to find some balance and trying to uh, give recognition for the uh, small intermediary who acts sim simply as an introducer between an issuer and a, a significant in investor. The purpose really was to elevate the business standards in this territory. Because the market was, going, was growing to such a significant degree, because we were seeing such significant retail participation, and because we were seeing some pretty uh, unsophisticated business practices being undertaken by those who uh, played the roles of exempt market dealers, it was really felt it was time to see the business practices elevated. So that was much of what was behind the impetus to bring in the registration category, having regard for the concern that we were going to overregulate an exempt territory and lay excessive costs on those who participate in this territory. Our early experience, uh, and it is pretty early, is that we've seen some pretty rough spots. Uh, the territory needs a lot of attention. There is a wide range, like everything else in this country, of uh, size, sophistication, experience in the territory. There are some very small players who are excellent. There are some very small players who don't have much of a clue about compliance and how to uh, run, a, run a business. And then, of course, some, some very large organizations that present concerns because they are large, but some level of comfort because they're able to engage uh, experienced people and to undertake uh, reasonable compliance practices. So we're focusing on business practices and infrastructure, uh, the capability of the chief compliance officer. We appreciate they're hard to find. We appreciate they're hard to train. We appreciate it's going to take some time for people in those positions to come up to standards. We're concerned about conflicts of interests. It's a competitive territory. People are trying to find a way to increase um, income and profit and conflicts of, of interest are a significant concern. We're trying to help educate on compliance obligations and good practices in respect of compliance. Simple concepts of suitability and due diligence need a lot of work in, in this territory for a great many of, of the participants. And higher standards are now expected by the investors because the exempt market dealers are coming with a label that they've been registered. And now there is a credibility jump that comes with regulation. I appreciate it comes with costs and a hassle, but it also comes with a credibility stamp. And investors uh, expect a higher level of, uh, of, of, of practice. Risk is the big issue. There must be, in our view as regulators, a proper conveyance to investors of the risk that they are undertaking in the exempt market. Risk is not bad. It's just something that needs to be understood. It's a concept that needs to be understood. And the correlation between risk and reward must be made clear to investors and must be properly understood by intermediaries and advisors participating in the territory. 
there appears to be a gap between the understanding of risk on the part of many exempt market dealers and the approach that regulators would take in respect of dealing with uh, risk. Um, I'm going to touch just quickly on crowdfunding. Um, this is the U.S. proposal to introduce the crowdfunding process into the territory of equity uh, fundraising. It's viewed by many in Canada as a panacea for the raising of capital by uh, small issuers. It should be understood that the process is not as simple as many would represent it. There is a significant regulatory uh, burden that's placed on the participants. I'd uh, made a presentation uh, earlier in the year and asked for a summary of some of the requirements, but the intermediaries in, in a crowdfunding process must be brokers or, or uh, uh, there must be a, a funding portal in, involved, which must be registered with an applicable self-regulatory organization. There are disclosure mandates mandated by the SEC in the US. There must be some assurance taken that investors review investor education materials and understand uh, uh, the subject of risk, loss, and illiquidity. The participants must take measures to reduce the risk of fraud, including making background checks on control persons that would be involved in issuers. Uh, escrow uh, proceeds uh, must be set aside until target offering amounts are received. Intermediaries may not compensate promoters, finders, or lead uh, generators for providing information on potential investors, and intermediaries and their control persons may not have a financial interest uh, sorry, a financial interest in the issuer. Funding portals, the, the online portals that would be available for the crowdfunding offer, offerings, um, they're remaining, they would be subject to, to the SEC. They must be registered in a category as a broker dealer or a special uh, category for, for portal. Uh, as I said, they must be a member of a national securities associations. And there's a range of prohibitions. The cost of all that is significant. The oversight involvement is significant. And, and uh, I think at a practical view, the crowdfunding alternative may not be the alternative that, that people think it is, not because it, it doesn't work in its own world, but the regulatory burden coming with it is significant, and the advice that we're receiving from issuers is that they don't want the hassle, and they don't want 450 shareholders that they're now responsible for and have to report to under regulatory requirements. They're afraid that having raised a very small sum of money, a regulator is going to come knock on their door and tell them that they've broken the law and that they're in, they're in big trouble. And the advice we're receiving from the law firms who uh, often act in IPO circumstances and take junior companies into the public markets is that the crowdfunding foundation is not a good foundation from which to move into the public markets. So it may be the wrong start if the uh, look down the road is uh, to enter, enter into, the, uh, into the public markets. So back to the fundamental uh, point, we're looking at ways to open up the exempt market um, if we're going to relax the regulatory requirements. We need some sense of confidence that the investor protection gap is being covered. Personally, I believe it, it resides in the intermediary, the advisor territory. We need the help of people like yourselves to give us the comfort that we can find, again, the right balance. And uh, our disclosure regime is as exhaustive as it can get 
Ed's referred to the complications, uh, the difficulty in understanding materials. That's a universal problem. We need people in the intermediary territory who can understand, who can give good advice, who can lead investors into uh, in an, an appropriate range, at least, of alternatives and give us some comfort that we can open the territory up on a broader basis to, to retail investors. Um, I don't have the time <laughs> to address some of Ed's concerns, but I, um, we have our challenges. Um, we have to keep up with many, many changes, and the, the, the market keeps moving on you. It's hard to find the right place that works one year and that is exactly right five years later. Um, I think we work hard at it. I think we do a pretty good job at it. Um, I think Ed, Ed had some fair criticisms around uh, the difficulty in developing policy, getting, getting feedback. The, the suggestion that there's a lack of accountability, I, I must say I have some difficulty in, in understanding. Uh, we feel accountable to a wide, wide range of people every hour of every day. We review our success in respect of our policy making and respect of our compliance reviews. Uh, and it is on our face because every day our organizations are in enforcement proceedings. So every day there's an investor in our offices who's giving evidence of having lost money and of having, having had a very bad experience in the financial markets. And that to us is the fact that we have a, a, a respondent in there that we're attempting to levy a challenge or a sanction on um, is, is not a subject for congratulations for us. It really indicates that somewhere along the line, something fell between the cracks. Somebody's been hurt. There's a loss of confidence in the markets. There hasn't been complete investor <laughs> protection. And those that I report to at our Ministry of Finance in Alberta, our finance minister, and eventually our premier are all very interested in those, those circumstances. We have a board that uh, we're accountable to. And I honestly don't get any sense within our organization of, of a lack of sense of accountability. That's different from trying to persuade you that we get everything right or, or that um, We've got that perfect balance we've been looking for, but there is a strong sense of, of responsibility and, and of accountability in respect of deficiencies that we, uh, we see going on. We need the help of organizations and of, and of people like this, and I really believe that if our security system across the country is to get better, it's by uh, seeing the standards of you and your groups and, and, and your profession improving and taking a greater and greater level of responsibility for your roles. Thanks. I think uh, what I wanted to start with today was uh, really to give you a bit of background, first of all, with respect to um, who IROC is. Um, certainly if you're a, a, a registrant of IROC, I, I would like to think you know who we are and what we stand for. Um, but many in this room are not necessarily uh, registrants of IROC, and so uh, I thought I'd take you very quickly through who we are. Um, obviously, uh, with the various regulatory and self-regulatory organizations that make up the regulatory landscape in Canada, um, there, there are a number of players. Uh, IROC as a national self-regulatory organization, I think, is, as uh, um, our moderator had indicated, uh, we're responsible for overseeing the activities of investment dealers and their registered employees. We're also responsible for overseeing all equity trading activity on Canada stock exchanges and uh, alternative trading systems, or ATSs. Important to note that unlike the provincial securities uh, commissions, which are obviously statutory regulators, um, IROC is a self-regulatory organization. Our uh, jurisdiction or authority over our member firms and registrants is based on contract law. Um, that uh, comes through or flows through the membership agreement in the case of uh, members, member firms, um, and our regula regulation services agreement with respect to the exchanges uh, and the ATSs. IROC's mandate is pretty straightforward. Um, protect the investing public, strengthen market integrity, 
um, and uh, maintain efficient and effective uh, capital markets by creating and enforcing an effective regulatory framework. Um, it sounds relatively straightforward when you say it quickly, um, not, nearly, not nearly so easy to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but in order to successfully pursue that mandate, we, uh, we recognize that we have to monitor and be responsive to the near perpetual state of change. You know, Ed made reference to that and I, I couldn't agree more. It's a complicated world. It's not getting any less complicated going forward and we recognize that. Um, the, uh, the landscape is changing um, within our industry and across the industry uh, generally. Uh, you know, the growth of execution only accounts in the products and support services that some of our member firms um, now provide to execution-only account holders is just one example. Uh, the growing popularity or the transition from traditional commission-based accounts to fee-based um, advice, um, as well as the changing demographic. I don't need to tell you as, as uh, financial planners, you're well aware of the changing demographics in Canada, the aging of the population, um, and the, uh, oh, there it is, and the, uh, where are we? Oh, great. There we are. Um, and the, uh, the changing, uh, the, the, the need to, um, to address the pension issues that, uh, that we spoke of uh, very briefly. So IROC, uh, IROC has developed and developed since our, uh, our creation three or four years ago, five years ago in 2008, I believe it was. Uh, following the merger of the IDA and uh, Regulation Services, Inc. Came up with a strategic plan. That strategic plan was recently uh, updated um, just a few months ago. And in that strategic plan, we expanded our uh, list of strategic priorities to a total of eight. Um, I've highlighted five here today, uh, the ones that I felt were the most relevant to the group. Um, again, common theme of the priority uh, of the strategic priorities is the protection of the investing public and the ongoing promotion of fair and competitive capital markets in order to, uh, uh, some might say bolster, others would say restore, and I think that's probably a fair, uh, that's a fair description of investor confidence. It is, um, I think it's an understatement to say investor confidence has taken a beating over the last several years. And, and we believe that IROC can play an important role in, in trying to rebuild that confidence, uh, frankly, by raising the regulatory bar and addressing regulatory challenges in a, in a timely and, a, and, and an effective way um, through, uh, through initiatives like the client relationship model um, that I'm going to talk about a bit more in a moment. The strategic priorities are pursued through key operational priorities. Um, uh, we, I, I'm responsible for member uh, policy development, um, and my colleague Wendy Rudd is responsible for the development of market policy. I can tell you both of our, uh, both our market and our member policy teams are running flat out all the time um, to keep up with the, the change and try to address the issues um, of which there are no shortage. Uh, we also work very hard to develop and communicate our regulatory expectations um, through our guidance notes as well as industry and uh, stakeholder consultation. And of course, a, a key part of our operation is our ongoing compliance oversight of the activities of our member firms, um, as well as uh, both from a prudential as well as a member conduct perspective. And unfortunately, if all else fails, um, timely and effective enforcement of IROC's uh, rules in order to send a, a strong deterrent message to those in the industry who may be tempted uh, to act improperly. Uh, a bit more about rulemaking. These are some of our, our key rule initiatives right now. Um, I, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are, are certainly well aware of our client relationship uh, model. Um, uh, but there are other key uh, initiatives underway as well, not the least of which is our plain language rule project, which I'm sure um, those of you who are IROC uh, registrants would love to see the, uh, the, f the uh, finalization of that project. I can tell you nobody in this room would like to see that finished more than me, and we are working diligently towards that. Um, and we're also undertaking a number of other things that I'll talk about a wee bit more, the fixed income uh, reporting proposal, um, as well as our EMD proposal. So a bit more about uh, CRM. Um, 
IROC's client relationship model, uh, which was approved by the CSA in March of this year, is really a compilation of rural revisions as well as new rural requirements and associated guidance. It really attempts, as I said earlier, to raise the bar uh, of investment industry professionalism and bolster investor confidence by ensuring that the interests of investors and advisors um, are more closely aligned and encouraging member firms and their advisors to shift more from a transactional focus to uh, focusing on the development and maintenance um, of a relationship uh, with their clients. CRM hopefully will, will do just that uh, by enhancing a number of disclosure uh, requirements regarding the services and fees that will be uh, uh, charged, um, as well as account performance. And uh, we also hope to clarify and strengthen the obligations of our advisors uh, and their employing firms by supplementing existing standards related to the disclosure and management of uh, both existing and potential conflicts of interest between the client and the advisor. Um, we're also hoping to enhance or have enhanced the suitability standards, which we hope will, will pay dividends by uh, now requiring um, our advisors to review portfolio and assess portfolio or suitability based on a portfolio basis as opposed to a trade by trade basis. Um, we're also asking our member firms and registrants to now assess suitability um, upon the occurrence of certain defined trigger events. Um, those include when a security is received into a client's account, uh, when there's been a change in the advisor or, or portfolio manager, and when there's been, this should be self-evident, but nonetheless, uh, when there's been a material change in the, uh, in the client's life circumstance um, or their investment objectives. Having said all of that, uh, we believe ultimately the success of CRM and indeed um, almost any rule initiative is, uh, or it depends on member firms and individual advisors really embracing the animating principles uh, of CRM and effectively implementing the policies, procedures, and undertaking the important uh, IT uh, projects uh, which, uh, which are necessary to fully comply with CRM's enhanced requirements. IROC uh, has been and continues to be uh, committed to and focused on the working with the industry to support the effective implementation of CRM. Um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, provided detailed guidance um, on uh, the CRM rule pro um, uh, proposals uh, that are now finalized. Uh, we've held a number of cross-country symposiums um, in, in uh, conjunction with uh, uh, the Investment Industry Association of Canada uh, to help our member firms understand the requirements and work through some of the, the, um, the operational issues that go along with the requirements uh, contained within CRM. And we've also posted webcasts for those across the country who weren't able to make it to those uh, symposiums. Um, Having said all of that, we recognize that CRM is a substantial undertaking for our member firms, um, and therefore we've mandated a, a phased uh, implementation approach that will see CRM fully and finally implemented by March of uh, 2014. Another important rule initiative um, relates to the fixed income market itself. Um, it, it's, uh, it's viewed by our organization the, as a key initiative. It's long overdue, frankly, given that the fixed income market uh, dwarfs the equity market despite the market's uh, lack of market transparency, which really stands in stark contrast uh, to, the, uh, to the equity markets, which are, are in comparison, uh, uh, very transparent. Uh, our ongoing efforts in this space began with the phased in implementation of our OTC fair pricing rule, uh, which began in October of 2011, and the final implementation step uh, came into force in September, uh, just past 2012. And going forward, uh, we are in the process of developing and we'll be introducing rule sets that will develop a more fulsome regulatory framework uh, for this very important market, um, including requiring dealers to report all fixed income trades to IROC in order to facilitate our oversight and surveillance of the OTC market activities in order to assess compliance uh, with the fair pricing requirements, uh, which began in 2011. 
you may also be aware that uh, um, uh, IROC, within the, I guess it was about three and a half months ago, published a concept proposal um, to address the, the ongoing EMD issue. Um, our comment period uh, uh, finished just a, a week or so ago. We're in the process of reviewing that feedback. Um, and we will be uh, uh, sitting down with the CSA and discussing the feedback uh, that we received. And obviously, we'll be taking um, next steps shortly thereafter. With respect to guidance, you recall one of our operational priorities is the ongoing provision of meaningful guidance to, to our member firms and, and their registrants. Um, you know, we, we, this, is, this is particularly important as we continue to evolve from prescriptive rules, the black and white rules, uh, to principle-based rules that really are necessary in order to provide us with the latitude necessary to effectively oversee and regulate um, a very diverse group of dealers uh, that vary in size, uh, complexity, and business models. Toward that end, and whenever possible and appropriate, uh, IROC provides formal written guidance linked to our new rule uh, proposals and the rule revisions in order to ensure that our registrants, as well as our larger stakeholder group, and it's a large one, uh, have a clear understanding of the rule requirements and IROC's regulatory expectations. This year, we've published a significant number of guidance notes relating to not only CRM, but also compensation structures, outsourcing, as well as a whole host of uh, market-related guidance notes as well. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, there are those who, despite our best efforts, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally fail to comply with their regulatory obligations. And in those cases, IROC's enforcement team uh, becomes involved and ensures that the individuals and or the member firms are held responsible uh, for, their, uh, for their actions and their trans transgressions. Um, and, and arguably, even more importantly, um, we, we strive to send a very strong deterrent message through our enforcement uh, activities. And really, just in closing, um, if you have any other questions uh, or require further information, our annual report and our various uh, sub-reports are always available on our on our website, and I, I want to be respectful of Karen's time, so I think I'll, I'll end it there. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'd first like to thank advocates for inviting me to speak this morning. Um, I'm sure everyone here is, has heard of the MFDA, but I thought I'd give a brief overview of our membership. We represent uh, approximately 120 members with over 80,000 approved persons in 20,000 branch locations across Canada. Our members manage over $427 billion of client assets, 95% of which is in prospectus qualified mutual funds in about 15 million retail client accounts. So clearly our main focus is retail clients and uh, the distribution of, of mutual funds. Now, I did want to talk about the, M the MFDA suitability project, but before, um, before I do so, I would like to comment on um, the CRM proposal that, that Paul mentioned. It is quite extensive and comprehensive, and the policy development process seems to be coming to an end. And then the next hurdle is implementation. Uh, as Vice President of Compliance at the MFDA, my job and that of the, my staff is to oversee implementation and the practical application of the CRM requirements. Uh, we know that this will not be an easy task for either of us. Given the nature, scope, and complexity of the CRM initiatives, we know there's going to be issues that we have not yet envisioned. We also know that the only way that we're going to have a successful result is if we work together on solutions. So please know you're not in it alone. And if you identify issues, please feel free to bring them to us and discuss them with us. Now, on to um, our suitability project. When I was reviewing the description of this plenary session, uh, one phrase that jumped out at me was street level regulation. And it really doesn't get any more street level than the suitability obligation. As everyone's aware, there are three core aspects to suitability obligation, knowing your client, knowing your product, and having a process to match those two. And while these concepts sound quite simple, um, accomplishing it is not exactly an easy task. With respect to the know your client requirements, when we first began our examinations in 2003, inadequate KYC was a common finding. 
KYC was missing, the forms we did find did not have well-defined terms, and in fact, when we'd interview advisors and supervisors within the same firm, everyone had a different view as to what these terms meant. We addressed this by reviewing every, mem every member's KYC forms and requiring all the terms to be sufficiently descriptive so clients could understand how the information was going to be used and impact the advice they'd be given and get, get an understanding of what their portfolio may look like. We also made sure member systems were able to record and compare client information to the product characteristics. Some members had to substantially change their KYC form and their back office systems, which um, in some cases led to uh, uh, large repapering exercises. We know that the process was frustrating and difficult, but through our combined efforts, working with members, we have seen a significant improvement in the quality of the KYC forms in use today. In 2005, we developed guidance on product due diligence. Before then, members were generally relying on information provided by issuers or assuming that if a prospectus was receded, then the security was okay to sell. Due diligence practices are much different today, and we are looking at providing even more guidance in this area. And finally, in 2008, we issued detailed suitability guidelines to assist members in establishing a supervisory framework to meet their suitability obligation. There were many diverse practices in place at the time. Some members were only assessing suitability of the trade without considering its impact on the portfolio. Some members didn't know which trades to review or how to review for suitability. And certainly few members had processes in, in place to supervise for leverage recommendations. Members were seeking practical assistance on compliance with their suitability obligation, and so we issued a notice, and then we subsequently followed it up with policy amendments and also additional guides. So where are we today? I will be the first to admit that it hasn't always been smooth sailing, but the industry has certainly evolved. As I mentioned, we've seen improvements in KYC information, member due diligence practices, and improvements in the level of supervision through more dedicated compliance resources and technological advancements in supervisory systems. These are not just my general observations. We, in fact, track and record and analyze all of our compliance findings in order to identify patterns and trends. And the number and severity of investment suitability issues we have identified has decreased through our examination cycles. We believe that the foundation for successful compliance has been built. Now we're looking at ways to improve upon it, and how do we do that? Well, recently the CSA published its 2012 Investor Index, which in indicates two in five Canadians fail the general investment knowledge test. The results also showed that 12% of Canadians had a re realistic idea of a rate of return on an average portfolio, 29% provided unrealistic estimates, and 59% didn't even want to answer the question. They didn't even want to guess. And when it came to what those same individuals expected from their own portfolio, the results were similar. So what can we do to improve upon that? Well, how many clients come to you and say they're feeling 50% medium risk? They're feeling 25% medium high and 25% low to medium. Clients don't use that language, and you as advisors have a very tough job trying to explain complicated investment terms to clients with varying educational backgrounds, different circumstances, and certainly different expectations. Now, I'm not saying the current system is broken. Many advisors do an excellent job today of asking the right questions to determine and translate client circumstances into the KYC terminology, but we think we can do better. We're looking at developing tools and resources, not just for dealers, but for advisors and for clients to facilitate a better understanding of KYC terminology and the risk return relationship, which hopefully will make all of our jobs easier. Our goal is to eliminate or at least significantly reduce the language barriers and expectation gaps. Well, we have a number of ideas in this area, including development of questionnaires and guides for advisors and their clients. Certainly, if you have any additional ideas, um, please feel free to send them to us or you can direct them through Advocus. Another area we will be focusing on or we are focusing on is senior investors. Seniors are a growing demographic and while we have focused our compliance enforcement activity um, on seniors, 
We are increasingly receiving requests from members and from financial advisors for additional guidance and education on how to act in the best interests of elderly clients when dealing with issues of diminished capacity or financial exploitation. Advisors have been asking us for help on how to identify a client with diminished capacity. It is difficult to identify without obvious symptoms. And then what do you do if you have concerns? Do you bring in relatives? Um, and what do you do with respect to privacy issues? What do you do if you have issues uh, or concerns with financial exploitation? It could be exploitation by family members, caregivers. Um, it may also involve improper use of powers of attorney. So what do you do in these cases? These situations may involve complicated legal issues and pose significant liability risks to advisors and their firms. And while each situation is unique, we are looking at providing additional best practice guidance to members on establishing internal processes for advisors to escalate these issues to compliance or legal staff, monitoring of accounts of seniors or the, and those operating under powers of attorney, and new account opening procedures to identify secondary contacts and additional disclosures to address privacy concerns. We're also looking at developing workshops with case studies to provide further training for advisors on indicators of diminished capacity and financial exploitation. Now before I close, I did want to point out that education and training is a core aspect of the MFDA's new strategic plan. I think it's fair to say that previously our focus has been on members. And while we'll continue with our member education and initiatives, we also plan on expanding into areas of advisor and investor education. We hope to have more direct and collaborative relationships with advisors in the coming years uh, to accomplish our overall goal of promoting a culture of compliance uh, within the industry for the protection of the investing public. So again, if you have any other ideas on areas for additional education or training for advisors that you'd like to see from the MFDA, again, please let us know or you can direct your comments through Advocates. Thanks. Um, I'd ask if anybody from the audience would like to ask any questions. If you, uh, we have a few microphones set up here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind standing up, stating your name and who your question is directed to, please. Roger. Uh, good morning. My name is Roger McMillan. Um, I noticed some of the comments on your slide about the uh, client relationship model. Uh, I sat on the fair dealing model, uh, the original fair dealing model, one of the committees. And it seems to me that many of those um, objectives are identical to the ones on the fair dealing model. Uh, those discussions kind of broke down, principally because they were more focused on protecting dealer interests than consumers. And I asked several questions about why wasn't there a couple of consumers on the committee and why weren't there a couple of advisors on the committee. My question to you is, and when I asked Charlie McFarland who the people were going to be that followed us on the committee after the fair dealing model closed up, he wouldn't tell me. I kind of suggested to him that that wasn't transparent. So my question specifically is, are there any advisors on the client relationship model committee per se? Uh, and are there any consumers on it? I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure which committee you're referring to. I, I, it sounds like you're referring to the CSA uh, uh, committee, not the IROC committee, is that right? Well, you have to take direction from the CSA. I mean, uh, when you adopt mm -hmm. the client relationship model, it's based on recommendations that were presented to you from the, the CSA, I presume. Well, I can tell you that, that IROC's policy uh, development process, and in, and in the case of CRM specifically, there wasn't a committee per se. Um, IROC's policy development process is essentially that the uh, there are there are consultations with standing committees like our compliance and legal section. Um, but in the case of CRM, there were there were any number of consultations well beyond and beyond what we normally do in our policy uh, uh, proposal process. Um, certainly all of our 
our process is very transparent, um, as I hope you know. Uh, all of our materials are posted on our website. Um, everything is posted for comment, and we formally respond to all comments. So yeah. I, I don't know if I'm addressing are, your, your question. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just, re uh, the reason I asked the question is because I was very interested in Mr. Rice's comments about his perception of where the solution lies. And it's my firm belief that the solution lies at that point where the consumer meets the advisor. So to the extent that you can do anything to improve the competency, the knowledge, um, the transparency of the advisor to the consumer, I think that's a really good thing. But so far, I haven't seen anything change in, I don't know, I can't remember when I came down every Wednesday to the Ontario Securities Commission. I think it's six years ago, and then they told us it wasn't working, and uh, they took us to lunch at the, the, um, the hotel on King Street, I think it was the Holiday Inn, on the premise that we couldn't really object if our mouth was full of their food. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and, and then I find out it comes down through the Canadian Securities Administration, the, the committee which was not disclosed. So it makes me kind of suspicious. So, and I, I was very elated to hear Mr. Rice's concerns about where he thinks the solution lies. And I, t and I totally agree. And there is a premise, and there was one other issue, is has the, has IROC investigated the possibility of making their employees more responsible to the consumer by making them uh, self-employed as opposed to employees of dealers? Has that possibility been thoroughly explored? And so the same applies to the MFDA. Um, you're your comments were, were uh, broad, so let me, let me try to address uh, some of those. With, with respect to your last point, with respect to the issue of self-employed or not, um, uh, I, I know that there has, been, there has been the view expressed many, many times by many, many people uh, to, uh, uh, with respect to the, perf the creation of, of, it goes to the, the issue of um, advisor and corporation. I don't know if that's what your question is really focused on. Um, I, I, um, I'm not sure that, that whether an advisor is self-employed or employed by a, a dealer member firm, um, I'm not sure that that, that, uh, that, that would necessarily impact um, the level of investor protection um, or the quality of service that that individual provides. Um, Frankly, um, we believe that our, our CRM uh, rule amendments and the new proposals, the enhanced suitability, um, are a step forward. Um, I'm sure there will always be those who feel we can go further. Uh, and, uh, but in terms of the enhanced transparency, you know, you made a comment, and, and rightly so, that it's important that the, the advisor and the investor have a clear understanding of the relationship in terms of what services will be provided, what the, what the investor or the customer can expect from their advisor. Uh, we believe that the CRM uh, uh, rule changes will certainly go a long way to improving that situation. Um, I know the CSA's uh, CRM working group is working towards finalizing their proposals relating to account and uh, cost disclosure, and we're working closely with them and those rules will be in place, uh, presumably in the near future. That again will enhance the transparency of the, uh, of the relationship in a really meaningful way in terms of understanding how your portfolio is performing and exactly what it's cost you to receive that advice over the, uh, over the past year. So um, I, uh, I, I, in the interest of time, I don't know if I should go on much further than that, but, uh, but we believe we, CRM does represent a step forward. I have a question on this side of the room here, please. Yes. Um, I was very glad to hear the last two speakers actually mention clients. One of my concern after 15 years in the business is client education. Um, my experience with reports, financial reports, uh, they're written in legalese in small print um, on multiple pages. <laughs> And the clients, you're very lucky if they even open the envelope because they're just intimidated. 
And I think it's vital. If you're going to educate us and control us, thank you, in some ways, <laughs> um, it's important that we present a united front and an educated front. But we need to help those clients understand and be involved. And that's not, that's not in an accessible way. Um, what's coming out as re financial reports now? And I'd like to hear your comments on where that's going. Do you have it directed, do you have it directed specifically to? Yeah. Um, well, the CRM initiative um, obviously has got um, uh, new reporting requirements, um, which will pose challenges to advisors in terms of having to explain these new documents. Um, and certainly one of the things that's going to be a challenge is ensuring that they're drafted in a way that it's very clear um, and to try to eliminate some of the, the technical jargon um, to make it easier for, for clients to understand, and, and it's a broad breadth of clients um, that you're going to have to direct those communications to. So certainly, we're going to be looking at that as, um, as members develop these reports to make sure that they are uh, plain language and clearly drafted. Question here. Yes, I, I didn't think I'd be up here, but I just find uh, this really gets me going. <laughs> and I'm sorry we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but uh, Ed, I, maybe I should ask you this question. And it's really about culture, culture in the industry. Um, I mean, we talk about protecting the consumer. We talked about protecting the consumer last year, and every year it's always about the consumer. However, we really don't look at the culture of the industry and say, how are we, how are we being paid? How, when you, when you build a product um, and the spin around it and the fees involved, it doesn't appear that it has anything to do with the performance of the product, that, that the, the product has to perform, whether it be through the IROC channel, on doing an IPO, it's the spin. It's the, it's, uh, and it's all about the fees and really if it, if it really works or not, accountability that isn't there financially and boom who gets nailed is the consumer whether it be through the mutual fund industry um, you know the the manufacturers of the funds have escalated financially have done extremely well I don't see their customers doing as well it hasn't it's never been there and I'm just saying gee is that really the way we should be culturally working what if the industry was changed where the manufacturers, the people that sell the product, have to now start to look at being paid more on performance rather than on fees. I'm, I'm not sure it was a question, but uh, that won't stop me from responding. <laughs> um, because I think we agree, uh, and, and I guess when I spoke about accountability and sort of focusing narrowly on little pieces of issues. And, and, and by the way, when I spoke about accountability, I should have said IROC scorecard is a great example of accountability that works. So, um, because what they do is they say, here's what we're going to do next year. And then at the end of the year, they say, here's what we actually got done. Um, and that's, that's meaningful accountability. You know, the systemic ch one of the systemic challenges that you allude to is you know, when you look at the financial services sector, uh, it, it may be the only supply chain you can find, it's the only one I can find, uh, where agents at every point in the supply chain, and it's a very long supply chain, tend to do better than principals. Um, if anything, the trend has been the reverse in almost every other supply chain because of technology, because of globalization. Financial services sector, it has stayed the same. Margins have stayed the same. Uh, you know, the rents tend to go to the agents, not to the principals. Now, that's a system, one of the systemic issues. It's also a great opportunity. So you look at a, a franchise like Vanguard that was able to build extraordinary market share by putting forward an alternative model. And, and the question becomes, who's going to seize that opportunity in Canada? Uh, the, the closest thing to addressing the issue of late 
hasn't been any of the stuff we've been talking about here. It's been a structural proposal for PRPPs, which looks like it's stillborn, unfortunately. But, but what was that? That was a proposal to develop low-cost default products that make simple products that make sense for the 65% of employees that aren't covered by uh, a corporate pension plan at this stage. Great idea. Hopefully it'll come to fruition. Uh, it's gotten bogged down in sort of jurisdictional issues and again the fact that when you're the Minister of Finance either at the federal level or at a provincial level, uh, PRPP sound like a great idea but there's a lot more pressing issues politically that you've got to deal with so somehow it slides down to the bottom of the agenda and it's not something that you're prepared to spend any currency on. Last question, Linda. My question is more of a macro question, and it concerns uh, the small, uh, let's, let's say the financial service sector. Um, and when we look at it, uh, I have concerns about, obviously we want to protect consumers, we want to make sure we're giving them right, the right advice, and we want to make sure that this whole sector is strong and striving. Um, but when you look at the way compliance is being applied, it is hurting one sector to a much larger extent than it is in the other sector. And my concern is that if you look at the pie, instead of having more pieces in that slice of pie, we're having fewer pieces. And the pie, instead of growing and more offering more financial services, which gives more choice, uh, we're seeing less of that. Um, so I'm not convinced that we're doing the right things, but I am convinced that we're all on the right page and we want to do the right things. So what are you as regulators doing to ensure that the small business sector is strong and striving and can provide additional services to make sure the consumer has a great deal of choice. Well, maybe I can say uh, something on that. Our, our mandate <clears throat> as securities regulators is to protect investors and protect the integrity of the capital markets. Our mandate is not to assist in the growth of small business um, or in the success of any of the participants who play in the capital markets. However, in undertaking our mandate, we are always mindful of the costs and the burden of applying regulation that has the impact of protecting investors and protecting the integrity of the market. So that's what the balance is all about. Although our mandate is not to um, undertake responsibility for the growth of small business, we fully appreciate at all times the impact that our regulation has on the ability of small business to grow. And uh, it, it is a significant challenge to try and determine where the right spot is to fulfill our mandate of protecting investors, protecting the integrity of the market. We talked earlier about the lack of confidence that investors have in the markets. I don't believe any of your businesses are going to be well served if there is no confidence in the part of investors in the capital markets. And in undertaking those responsibilities, I can assure you we are at all times mindful of the costs and of the impact that it has and try to minimize it. So although our responsibility is not to assist in the growth of small business, we certainly are mindful of trying to minimize the negative impact that, that regulation has. So do we get it right? Probably not most of the time or perfect, but I can assure you that a great deal of effort goes into trying to find the, the uh, right point of balance. Terrific. Thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. Uh, I want to uh, send out a special thanks to our panelists who were able to take part in our uh, securities panel to kick off the morning. And uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, Paul. Good luck.